Welcome to Talking Business, a podcast produced in Melbourne, Australia. The podcast is available on the ACAST app, the Apple Podcast Store, or wherever you go to get your podcasts. Or you can get it at the Business Acumen website at www.businessacumen.biz. I am Leon Gettler. My job is to review and monitor the week's news in business, finance and economics. I bring it all to you every week. This is episode number 17 in our series for 2021, and today's date is Friday, May the 28th. First, I'll be talking to Workspace's founder and managing director, Jenny Foley, about how many businesses and offices are slowly bringing staff back to work and how they're changing staff and customer behaviour. And I'll be talking to Indeed economist, Callum Pickering, about the latest labour force and wages figures. But now, let's talk to Jenny Foley. Jenny, you have some views about people coming back to the offices. How have the rules of engagement changed? Well, changed by by a lot. Uh, Firstly, I know it's inconvenient when people walk into the workplace to have to sign in, but that is essential. We require our clients to sign in, uh, especially if you're coming in to, um, uh, especially visitors. We make sure all our workspaces have hand san- sanitizers, which are, you know, you don't have to press, you, you just put your hand underneath the sanitizer and it comes out. So we encourage all our, our clients because, you know, you don't know where you've been. You've been, could have caught public transport, coming up a lift, been close in close proximity to others while you're walking down the street or at the traffic lights. So, you know, it's essential to sanitize your hands. It's inconvenient, but it's the way to go. Greeting now, the new handshake is either a wave or an elbow rub, no more hugs and, and handshakes, unfortunately, you know, or a lovely warm smile and a bright hello that, you know, greetings have changed. Also, keeping a polite distance in the workplace is very important. You know, keeping 1.5 a meter distance from someone else. If you're in a shared area, to make sure you're not sitting too close to someone, talking right into their face, keeping a polite distance, wiping up after yourself. You know, when you use common areas and the space, uh, we have shared a lot of shared areas. So if you're going to sit in an area, uh, we have we make sure there's a lot of paper towels and sanitized wipes. So to use that to wipe your laptops, your hands, uh, your workspace, and after you've used the space, uh, I think it's respectful to uh, to wipe that area. The shared kitchens, you know, everything's provided there. We now have paper cups and and uh, and wooden stirrers. Now it's not as as attractive and as lovely to drink from as your favorite, you know, cups, but it is safe and. Uh, and, you know, it's clean, so to make sure to, to use that, or if you're using your, your favourite cup to wash it yourself, not expect someone to wash it, or rinse it and put it in the dishwasher. If you're using the paper cup to make sure you dispose of this safely in, in a, the recycle bin, rather than just leaving it in a sink and leaving it for someone else to dispose for you. You know, avoid touching other people's phones, um, and, you know, when you go in the restroom, make sure that paper towels or, you know, you're not using your hands, uh, use your elbows. So time has changed a lot. Gone are the days when, you know, you can uh, be seen uh, to be a hero and struggling to work. If you're not feeling well, I think the respectful thing to do is to stay at home and work from home rather than struggling and be seen as a hero, uh, you know, that you're dying and, <laughs> and you want to go in to work. Because I think you're just spreading germs. I think those days are over. Those are primarily the, the points. And in, uh, if a vaccination, you can be vaccinated, I think that's very, very important to do. Uh, how aware do you think people are of all these changes? I mean, uh, I think to some extent they are. But I mean, when I notice people out socially, when I notice them out at uh, workplaces and supermarkets, they don't seem to be that aware of all those issues. Yes, that's, uh, that's very interesting. In our workspaces, uh, we have locations all around Australia, well, not all around, in Brisbane, Gold Coast, uh, Melbourne. We, our staff, try to encourage our clients to do this. We make sure that everyone that comes into the office do, do sign in and they do sanitise their hands. And our staff make sure the common areas and the shared areas are are wiped down regularly. We've also trained our cleaners to do the right things. And I think, you know, the clients are very, they're fantastic. They, they respond to this. They know you're trying to keep them safe and uh, keep them in a safe environment. So uh, I don't know about supermarkets, but uh, definitely in our workspaces, we're definitely seeing clients responding to that. They're wanting to 
to, to keep safe. And we're also finding they don't seem to come in if they've got a cold or a cough or they, they tend to stay home. Yes. So, pe so people are very much aware of this? Definitely, definitely. The only thing I think with the vaccination, there's a few not wanting to do that, I, I strongly recommend uh, that occurs to keep yourself safe and keep others safe. Uh, even though that with something like AstraZeneca, there are side effects. That's correct. That's correct. So there are a lot of people reluctant to, you know, but I think the the side effects is a minority, but each to their own. But I, I would, I've had it. I've had no side effects. I didn't even feel a thing. So there you go. Well, yes, and uh, side effects are, well, you know, they're, they're better than COVID. Yes, yes. Indeed, indeed. Yes, that's correct. That's correct. So it depends which, which you prefer, right? Um, and I think it might be just bad luck if uh, if they, you have this. Uh, I, I didn't um, have the uh, any side effect at all. I didn't even feel it when it was given to me. So there you go. Well, the $64 question is um, how long will this continue for? Because uh, we've been more than 12 months in this um, COVID True. regime and doesn't True. look like it's going away anytime soon. Quite true. And uh, so how long do you think we can keep this going for? And how long should it be going? Well, you know, a lot of this is things that we should have been doing anyway, you know, uh, being respectful, especially in the shared areas, the wiping down after yourself. I mean, that's just a respectful thing to do. You know, we did go through a stage where, you know, we had clients that were just very, you know, messy. They would uh, have a cup of tea or a coffee and just leave it there and expect someone to pick up after them and wash up. We're finding they're far more respectful now. And it's a, it's a great way to go. And I think washing your hands, you know, we all forgot to to do that uh, I think that's lovely you know to be able to do that and I think we all you know marched into work whether we were sick or we had a cold and you know I think we've all learned to be able to work from home now and you know we have zoom we have that the, you know we've all found that we can work from home as well so that's a great thing and I think it's a wonderful way of moving forward you know uh, we don't really have to go to a workspace which is great and and yet it's there when we need to go well, the interesting question will be whether this will change workplaces permanently. Yeah. Uh, because uh, we're hoping in time COVID will become less of an issue. Yeah. And whether this will continue regardless. Uh, yes, I think, you know, the travelling to work. A lot of people travelled quite extensively to work, uh, sometimes an hour, an hour and a half a day. Uh, we try to employ people that live closer to our workspaces purely because I feel, you know, you know, they, at least they can walk to work if they have to. I think that travelling is, is huge. So what we're doing is trying to create little workspace pods all around um, Australia that people can work closer to home. So you don't have to travel, you know, it's close to home. You can walk, you can ride your bike, you can, you know, and working in a garden setting, open fresh air, you know, not, not with shared air conditioning. I think all times are going to change and the way we work is going to change, but maybe for the better. So uh, we're going to see a whole lot of workspaces pods around. That's right. That's right. That's where we're going. <laughs> so rather than just be focused in the city, which we used to be, and in big buildings, high-rise buildings, you're going to find them more kind of homes converted into offices where it's, uh, you know, in a garden setting where people can walk, ride their bikes um, or drive if they have to and there's plenty of parking. Um, they can open their windows and not have shared air conditioning, have open their windows and have fresh air, you know, that sort of thing. And I think that's that will probably be the future. So they can work from home or work close to home. Uh, do you find, a final question, do you find this has actually created enormous behavioural change among your clients? Definitely, definitely, definitely. Absolutely, we've seen that, absolutely. And with your staff as well? Definitely, absolutely. Uh, especially our staff, they've responded beautifully. Um, our staff are, you know, my heroes. They're just fabulous. They're a beautiful team. And because there's a lot they have to ensure uh, in the workspace that they run, that, uh, you know, clients sign in, they, they keep their workspace tidy and clean and safe. Um, so, you know, they have to, there's a lot for them to oversee. Uh, they have to make sure the kitchens are wiped down regularly. You know, things are disposed of. The dish, there's no, nothing in the sinks and dishwashers. Everything's clean. So, you know, it's a lot of, they have a lot of responsibility now and they've really responded to it. It's been fabulous. Well, it'll be fascinating to watch and 
Jennifer, thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. And now let's talk to Indeed economist Callum Pickering. Callum Pickering, what's your view of the latest labour force figures? Well, it was a bit of a, a mixed result for April. Um, the headline figures are that employment fell by uh, 30,600 people. Obviously, that's not ideal. But we also saw the unemployment rate fall to 5.5%. Um, and we also saw a decline in the underemployment rate to 7.8%. And that was the lowest level in around seven years. So there were some negatives, um, but there were certainly some positives as well. What impact does JobKeeper have on the numbers? Well, this is a really interesting one. When you see that employment fell by uh, 30,600 people, you immediately think that's going to be JobKeeper related because, of course, JobKeeper was lifted on 28th of, of March and these are the, the April job figures. But the ABS is adamant that that's not the case. They don't believe that the decline in employment had anything at all to do with JobKeeper ending. Um, and the fact that unemployment also declined in April does, I think, provide a little bit of evidence in, in favour of what the ABS is saying, which means that the, the fall in um, employment for the month of April has to do with other factors beyond JobKeeper. It'll be interesting to see whether that changes next month when the, the May data comes out, because we had anticipated that the impact of, of JobKeeper was going to be seen in both the April and May labour force surveys. Um, if there was no impact in April, then it is likely we're going to see something when the, the May figures come out next month. We can still expect some impact of, uh, of the JobKeeper uh, issue on the labour force numbers. It, it seems that way. I mean, there were wildly different expectations around what the end of, of JobKeeper could mean for the labour market. There was some people saying the jobs could employment could decline by 150, 200,000 people. It seems unlikely that that's the case based on what we're seeing in the overall labour market, um, particularly given that hiring activity remains so strong. That does suggest that there's maybe a possibility that the economy is going to absorb the impact of, of JobKeeper through strong hiring activity. So that's going to be an interesting one to watch. But, but certainly if employment does fall next month, and if the fall isn't particularly large, then I think we can conclude that the Australian economy has done a pretty good job of adjusting for life uh, post JobKeeper. Okay, but uh, I mean the interesting issue was that hours worked was down, and so was the participation rate. Yeah, so there's a few things going on here. Hours worked declined by 0.7 percent in the month of April, and the reasoning is that uh, a larger than normal amount of people were taking extended Easter breaks. So we actually saw this a little bit around the Christmas time. We saw a lot of people take holidays over Christmas more than normal. We've seen the same thing happen with Easter, which does suggest that, you know, Australians aren't necessarily taking as many holidays as they normally would throughout the year, and then they may be saving their holidays for these sort of bigger events where you can tie in a few days off work along with all the public holidays and, and get a sort of more extended break. So I'm not too concerned about the decline in hours worked in, in the month of April um, because we did see something similar back in, in December. And again, the participation rate has come off a little bit, but still remains at a pretty high level by historical standards at, a, at around the same level it was before the pandemic began. Nonetheless, the participation figures would have affected that uh, drop in employment, uh, unemployment to 5.5%. Would that be the case? Yeah, that's right. So normally when employment declines, um, we would expect the unemployment rate to increase. Whereas in April, we actually saw the unemployment rate decline to 5.5% from 5.7% back in March. And the reason that occurred was because participation in the workforce declined in April. So employment fell, but also unemployment fell. And so the labour force... Uh, in total, was a bit smaller in April than it was in March. Now, we don't know how meaningful that is because we do see this sort of volatility from, from month to month. It's not that unusual for something like this to happen, um, but we always need to sort of put it in context of what's happening over a number of months as opposed to just a, a single monthly outcome. And the, uh, what's happening over a number of months is that the unemployment figure keeps falling month to month. Yeah, that's right. I mean, we've seen pretty consistently strong employment growth, uh, with the exception of April, 
over the past six months or so. I mean, that's driven the unemployment rate down much faster than policymakers had an- anticipated. You know, it was back in February that the Reserve Bank thought we might get down to a 5.5% unemployment rate by the end of next year, whereas we're already here and it's only April data. So we're well and truly ahead of schedule, and that's a sign that the recovery has been quite strong, that there are a lot of jobs out there right now, and that um, businesses are pretty confident about the the economic outlook for the country. Now, what about uh, full-time and part-time work? How did that go? It's always pretty volatile from month to month, but in in the month of of April, um, we saw pretty strong gains in, in full-time employment and a bit of weakness in, in, in part-time. So they came off a, a, a fair bit. Like I said, they are quite volatile from for month to month. I think that the sort of take-home point that I would focus on more is that since October, um, full-time jobs have accounted for around three-quarters of employment gains over that period. So very fast recovery that we have seen over the past six months or so has primarily been driven by full-time jobs, which means that the economy is creating a lot of high-quality, high-paying jobs right now, and that's always a good sign. That's the sort of thing we would expect to see in a reasonably strong economy, and that seems to be where um, job creation has shifted over the, the past six months, and it's obviously something that we hope continues over the remainder of this year. Right, and uh, part-time work, though, slipped this time around. Yeah, it did. The The recovery pattern for part-time work has been really quite interesting because part-time employment drove the initial recovery. You'll remember all the, the jobs that were temporarily lost in uh, retail and, and hospitality. They all came back very early in in the, uh, the recovery process. And so employment in part-time jobs boomed. And then it sort of slowed down. Um, and it's sort of been a little bit weak over the past six months, certainly in comparison to what we've seen in, in full-time um, job creation. Now, what's interesting, though, is that the budget was actually foreshadowing uh, unemployment to drop to 4.75% next year. Now, uh, what's your view about that? Well, I think given the momentum the economy currently has and, and given the level of fiscal support that is still in play, both this year and next... I think these unemployment expectations are actually quite reasonable. Um, In fact, I think that there could even be a little bit of upside there. That is that the unemployment rate could continue to decline a little bit faster than policymakers had anticipated. So I I think there is a a very good chance over the next 12 to 18 months that we could see unemployment rates that we haven't seen since um, before the global financial crisis. Right, Okay, And so if it uh, drops down to 4.75%. That raises questions of what impact that would have on wages. And I would say you'd have to get down to the low fours, wouldn't you, till it starts having impact on wages and inflation. Would that be right? Yeah, I, I tend to, to agree with that. I think that 4.75% would certainly help, but I would definitely want to see an unemployment rate of uh, well below 4.5% in order to facilitate the sort of wage growth that is necessary to get inflation back within the 2 to 3% RBA target. Um, and that, that wage growth we'd be looking for is, a, is above 3%. And that's something that we haven't seen in eight years. So if we do get there, it'll, it'll be quite the economic achievement because, you know, there's been a lot of policy support over the, the past eight years and we, and we really haven't gotten close to achieving that. The big uncertainty, though, is that we don't know precisely the level of unemployment that's going to be required to facilitate that higher wage growth. We suspect it's a bit under 4.5%, but what we've seen overseas, particularly in the recovery from the GFC, is that in some cases, such as the United States, it took the unemployment rate getting even lower than that to really facilitate higher wage growth. So it's going to be a sort of a key for the Australian economy going forward. The other issue, too, of course, is that you could have other inflationary pressures occurring. Now, uh, you've got inflationary pressures appearing up overseas with raw material prices, commodity prices, and yeah. that could actually have it start having an impact here, which could exercise the RBA's mind. Uh, there, there is a potential for that. I think that the RBA isn't going to overreact to a temporary pickup in inflation. So if headline inflation increases to 2.5% or 3% over the next six months or so, um, and it is being driven by overseas factors, the RBA may be willing to, to look through that temporarily. 
because what they really want to see is sustainable and persistent inflationary pressures. And from a domestic standpoint, that usually requires pretty strong wage growth. You can always temporarily get inflation pretty high through overseas factors. Um, oil prices increase by a lot, and that flows through to inflation, and suddenly you get a big number. But it's usually not the cause of um, consistently high inflation. Um, usually that's driven by more domestic factors such as wages. So I'm not too concerned about the Reserve Bank pulling the trigger early um, just because inflation maybe gets a, a little bit high at some point during 2021. I think they're going to want to see um, those more consistent inflationary pressures being driven by domestic factors such as wage growth. And certainly we might see unemployment slipping even below the 4.75% uh, given the trends we're seeing right now. Well, that's right. This um, recovery has exceeded all expectations. It's tracking um, much ahead of um, where we thought we'd be six months ago. And I think there's still a fair bit of upside risk around that. Um, the level of fiscal support we're going to see over the next couple of years is considerable. And if the economy continues to improve as it has, there is certainly that possibility that we have a, a genuinely quite strong economy with a lot of jobs being created and skill shortages emerging across you know, certain pockets of the economy. And if that occurs, then it is likely we are going to see that, that stronger wage growth, um, a very low unemployment rate, and the potential for interest rates to maybe rise a little bit earlier than the Reserve Bank has flagged, because they've been pretty adamant um, in recent months that they don't think anything's going to happen until 2024 at the earliest. Um, but I think there, there's certainly some, some upside risk there that, that could contribute to an earlier-than-expected rate rise. Well, we'll be watching it with great interest. Thank you very much for your time. And thank you. So what's happening in the news? Well, China has warned Australia it is in for economic pain in the near future and saying plans to hit our highest export are already taking effect and could wipe billions from our economy. According to Comsec, iron ore prices are down sharply again, dropping US $11.85 a tonne or 5.9% to US $188.25 a tonne after hitting a record high of more than US $230 a tonne earlier this month. That comes after it dropped 5.1% at the end of last week, sending shockwaves through mining companies on the stock market. The valuable steelmaking ingredient is by far Australia's biggest export and a whopping 60% of it is gobbled up by China for its constantly churning mills. Sparked by China's high demand for steel, the roaring iron ore trade has thrown Australia an economic life jacket in the midst of a coronavirus recession. But Beijing has had enough of paying record prices for it and is cracking down hard to reduce the cost. On Sunday, the National Development and Reform Commission, the NDRC, China's top economic planner, along with four other departments, held a meeting with industry leaders and vowed to severely punish excessive speculation, price gouging and other violations that they sell to help lift prices. Regulators would adopt a zero-tolerance approach towards illegal activities and strengthen regulation of abnormal transactions and malicious speculation, the NDRC said in a statement. The skyrocketing oil prices are putting China's economic recovery from the pandemic at risk, with companies and everyday Chinese citizens bearing the cost. Chinese government mouthpiece, the Global Times, says companies have already raised prices for a wide range of products, including refrigerators, washers and bicycles, citing rising costs. However, analysts told the paper that China's latest move to crack down on speculations and other market manipulation is about to send chilling waves across the globe. The Times singles out Australia as a nation that will be hit hardest by the crackdown, given iron ore is such a dominant force in our exports, and accused us of profiteering from the rising prices. Among the most effective could be iron ore exports from Australia, which has benefited massively from the sky-high prices in its main export, emboldening officials in Canberra to continue on their relentless provocation against China, the paper stated. While China's reliance on Australian iron ore will likely continue in the foreseeable future, despite its efforts to diversify sources, sharp drops in iron ore prices would mean heavy losses in export revenue for Australia, which has already seen declining trade with China in areas such as wine and seafood. It says that iron ore prices have dropped $9.25 per tonne since Beijing took action last week. It says that could translate into a loss of over $2 billion in extra revenue for Australia, based on the amount of exports to China in the first four months of 2021. And Melbourne has braced for another hit to its economic recovery after a local breakout rapidly ballooned to 15 cases. Businesses were told to mandate masks for indoors. New Zealand shut down its travel bubble. States imposed travel restrictions and major events prepared for further restrictions. 
The blowout in COVID-19 cases across northern Melbourne saw authorities impose an indoor mask mandate, restrict public gatherings to 30 people and a limit on house guests to five per day from 6pm on Tuesday night. Business leaders said the new restrictions would affect confidence recovering from one of the world's longest lockdowns. A major 10-day winter cultural festival called Rising opened among fears by organisers that interstate travellers will not risk coming to Melbourne, leading to hotel and restaurant cancellations. The new gathering restrictions do not apply to hospitality venues or workplaces. However, masks are now mandatory at both, as authorities said such places were easier to contact trace than social gathering. And the Federal Environment Department wrongly skipped a key assessment when approving a water pipeline for Adani's massive Carmichael coal mine, a court has ruled. The North Galilee Water Scheme would extend a dam and pump water 110 kilometres to the coal mine in central Queensland to suppress dust and wash coal. A department official in 2019 decided the project wasn't a coal mining activity or involving a large coal mining development. Deeming it so would have mandated an assessment of whether the pipeline and other infrastructure had or was likely to have a significant impact on water resources. In the federal court on Tuesday, Justice Melissa Perry ruled the delegate made an error of law by finding the harvesting and supply of water for decades was not integral to the conduct of mining operations at the Carmichael mine. As a result, the project's approval was set aside and will be sent back to the department to restart the approval process. And more than 700 highly paid employees of NBN Co, the taxpayer-owned body which runs and operates a national broadband network, received average personal bonuses of $50,000 last year. New data submitted to Federal Parliament this week shows the government-owned enterprise, which paid out almost $78 million in bonuses to staff despite the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression, rewarded more than 3,800 staff with cash payments. And the journey through COVID-19 lockdowns, social distancing and closed borders has left a lasting imprint on consumers, ranging from health to savings and career goals that is now playing out in spending habits. It is between the generations, from Gen Z to pre-boomers, where the differences are starkest. There's been a split between the young, middle-aged and the old as the pandemic meant something different to every generation. A new survey, the inaugural Commonwealth Bank Insights Report, has shed a light on consumer behaviour post-pandemic and discovered shoppers eager to buy locally sourced products, frequent neighbourhood shopping centres and many cutting overall spending to preserve cash. And when they are spending, it's increasingly online, using mobile wallets such as Apple Pay rather than cash. The Combank survey of almost 5,700 consumers found the pandemic had affected the people live, work and spend and that while some were able to boost savings, COVID reduced the household income of more than a third of Australians surveyed. One in four report having less money to spend on necessities. This reflected the uneven ramifications of the pandemic, with what generation a shopper was born into often dictating their experience. The uneven impact of the pandemic is highlighted by the experiences across the generation, CBA says. And Facebook Australia was paid $712 million by local advertisers using its platform in 2020, but trimmed its income tax bill to just over $20 million through a reselling arrangement that minimises profit to $17.6 million. The social media giant's tax bill comes as it tries to avoid being included under the Morrison government's media bargaining code designed to rebalance bargaining power between tech giants and local media companies by signing agreements with publishers to pay for their journalism. Facebook scooped up more than $700 million in Australian advertising revenue last year by boosting its online sales as the nation spent more time at home and online through the pandemic. With much of its ad revenues expensed back to its US parent, the tech giant's tax bill was just $20.2 million. Documents lodged with corporate regulator the Australian Securities Investments Commission reveals Facebook Australia Proprietary Limited generated $712.7 million in Australian advertising sales last calendar year, up 5.7% on a year earlier. Because Facebook views its Australian business as a reseller of ad inventory across its flagship website, Instagram and Messenger apps, it books a reseller expense to be ultimately paid to its California parent. And last year, $559 million in in Australian sales were expensed. This huge expense bill allows a company to sharply reduce its Australian profits and puts potential local earnings out of reach of the tax man. After this reseller expense, Facebook declared net ad sales in Australia of $154.6 million, down 7.4% on the year earlier. Net profit for the year for the Australian business came in at $37.86 million, slightly down on $39.48 million a year earlier. The $20.2 million tax bill compares to the previous year's $16.8 million. And energy giants Shell and PetroChina have been hit with a $1.2 billion write-down on their Australian gas business due to a commodity price slump, double the previous year's level, with losses now nearing $9 billion since 2010. 
The pair's Arrow Energy joint venture recorded a $606 million loss for the 2020 financial year after an $866 million loss the year before, with torrid oil and gas markets unsettled by the pandemic, triggering a huge write-down for the Queensland-based energy operator. And Finer says it will use its open bank accreditation from the competition regulators to speed up the delivery of insights on how customers can save money on their loans and insurance products generated by its app, which has 555,000 users. Finder co-founder Fred Chibester said the green light from the Australian Competition Consumer Commission late last week to ingest big bank data when its users give permission under the government's open banking regime will help the comparison site win more trust as it moves towards its vision of creating an artificial intelligence system that helps people optimise their finances. Finder's app, which was launched late last year, already allows customers to work out if they're likely to be rejected for a loan or a credit card, which could adversely impact their credit score and compromise access to a mortgage later in life. The app also added cryptocurrency buying and selling last week. User data is accessed via a screen scraping process where users share banking passwords, but Mr Shabesta said shifting to open banking to begin later this year would help to build trust and widen its customer base. And the death of the big-budget television beer ad may be upon us. Alcohol brands will reduce their television advertising spending by 2.4% a year, a report from global media agency Zenis says. Australia has spawned a litany of excellent TV beer campaigns, from a thirsty tongue for Tui's to a symphony of beer bottles for VB and perhaps the most well-known of all, the big ad for Carlton Draft. But the days of the carefully crafted television ad design to get the punters talking and drinking are probably over as audiences on mass advertising platforms such as TV shrink. Zenith predicts alcohol brands would cut their spending on TV ads to 2023, shifting some to outdoor billboards and doubling down on digital ads. And more than 500,000 Australians moved to faster MBN plans in the first quarter of 2021, the Australian Competition Consumer Commission says in its latest wholesale market indicators report. The report showed that about 8.3 million services were now connected to the network, which is being rolled out by the MBN Co. HCC Commissioner Anna Brakey said more than two-thirds of all MBN connections were now 50 megabits per second or above, and above 17% were using connections that deliver 100 megabits per second or above. On the downside, there are almost 465,000 fewer home fast 100 megabits per second and 140 megabits per second services in the same quarter, which the ACCC said was partly due to the end of a particular promotion. Other promotions aimed at even higher speeds have now been introduced. The ACCC's report showed there was a significant take-up of services above 250 megabits per second, which are called superfast, in the first quarter with the number growing 11,136 at the end of the final quarter of 2020 to 490,000 at the end of March this year. The number of connections that the ACCC calls ultrafast, 500 megabits per second to 1,000 megabits per second, grew from 9,924 to 83,000 by the end of March. And workers at explosives giant Orica have been permitted to stop laying charges at mine sites if they've concerned about impacting her indigenous heritage, as Rio Tinto's destruction of a Jucan Gorge caves last year heightens caution across the industry. Orica Chief Executive Sanjeev Gandhi said the blasting of the 46,000-year-old site in Western Australia's Pilbara, which has been attributed to Rio Tinto's failure to adequately engage with the land's traditional owners, has prompted a reassessment of Orica's own internal controls to help prevent such disaster happening again. Monday marked the first anniversary of Rio's disastrous decision to blast through two ancient rock shelters at Dukang Gorge, which was legally sanctioned to enlarge a neighbouring iron ore mine, but went against the wishes of the Puti, Kunti, Kurama and Pinakura, or PKKP people who have been left devastated and said they were not aware of Rio's intention to proceed with a blast until it was too late. Birchall Hayes, a director of PKKP Aboriginal Corporation, described the anniversary as not only a day of great sorrow, but an urgent reminder that government and industry need to act quickly to prevent another tragedy. And Crown Resorts has already contravened its new anti-money laundering policy to not receive cash deposits, an inquiry has heard. Adding to the cache of evidence, casting doubts on Crown's ability to reform and rid its casinos of financial crime. The Victorian Royal Commission to Crown also heard the James Packer Bank Casino Group for more than a year ignored expert advice, telling it to examine key bank accounts identified as facilitating money laundering before hastily commissioning a deliberately limited review sparked by the New South Wales Bergen Inquiry spotlight on the accounts. 
giving evidence to the Royal Commission to Crown suitability to operate its South Bank Casino licence, the principal of anti-money laundering consultancy initialism, Neil Jeans, said he discovered evidence for breach of Crown's new policy, which prohibits third party and remittance payments to be deposited into Crown's bank accounts. It was also revealed that 14 of 45 Crown bank accounts showed evidence of still being used to facilitate money laundering as recently as February. These accounts were not examined by last year's damning New South Wales Bergen inquiry, which only examined the Perth-linked Riverbank and Melbourne-linked South Bank account, meaning those new revelations could be just the tip of the iceberg, Council assisting the Royal Commission, Meg O'Sullivan, told the inquiry. And a $100 million battery to be built in southwest New South Wales will support a $3.2 million contract won by Shell and Edify Energy to power schools, hospitals and state government buildings for the next 10 years, in stark contrast to Canberra's focus on gas to supply power on demand. New South Wales Energy Minister Matt Keane said the 100 megawatt battery would provide critical dispatchable electricity before the closure of AGL Energy's Liddell Coal Power Station in 2023. The battery will have a maximum power output of 100 megawatts and capacity of 200 megawatts per hour, meaning it can run for two hours at maximum output before having to be recharged. And Commonwealth Bank of Australia has invested $30 million in local e-commerce startup Little Birdie in the largest ever funding round for an Australian startup that has yet to launch a product. Little Birdie is the latest venture of Catch Group founders Gabby and Hesse Labovich, with co-founder John Beeros leading the company as chief executive, and the Labovichs retaining an interest as 10% investors. It is yet to launch, but bills itself as a new homepage for online shoppers, where there will be more than 70 million products to search, compare, track and share deals, with AI technology and an online user community voting up and promoting the best deals available. Its $30 million funding round has been filled by Commonwealth Bank, which intends to integrate Little Birdie's shopping content into its mobile app. This would give Little Birdie direct access to CBA's 11 million customers, while supporting the bank's plan to target younger customers through its banking and partner ecosystem. And Sanjeev Gupta has crept closer to securing the future of South Australia's wireless steelworks after holding very constructive and productive meetings in Dubai to refinance debt held with banking giant Credit Suisse. Mr Gupta Liberty Steel Group said the company was in advance talk with Credit Suisse to reach a formal standstill agreement on its Liberty Primary Metals Australia business while refinancing is completed that will repay Credit Suisse out in full. And the Queensland Government has announced a $7.5 million package to lure workers to take up tourism jobs in regional Queensland. The incentives will be offered for jobs stretching north from Mackay to regions west of Toowoomba. From July the 1st, job seekers would be offered a $1,500 incentive to relocate, as well as $250 in travel vouchers in the year-long Work in Paradise campaign. Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk said there's strong demand for workers across the state, from bartenders and deckhands to tour guides, as the industry rebuilds after being hit hard by the COVID-19 pandemic. The state government has invested about $800 million into the tourism industry through the pandemic. And surging land prices will force people away from detached houses and back into apartments, triggering a boost in new apartment construction over the next four years. It will be further reported by return of investors. The Australian Construction Industry Forum, or ACIF, May 2021 forecasts show stronger housing, both standalone and detached, has prompted ACIF to boost its latest forecast for housing construction for 2021 to over $105 billion from $97 billion at last forecast in November. But from 2022 onwards, construction of apartments, townhouses and semi-detached homes will surge. ACIF has added an extra $8.8 billion to its attached house forecast for next year, while detached housing weakens through to 2025 due to the loss of stimulus measures and higher land prices. And that's it for this week. And next week, I'll be talking to Yannick Ieko, founder and CEO and senior lending strategy of the SMSF Loan Experts. And we'll be talking about how people are using their SMSFs to invest in some really interesting and different and quirky investments, including accommodation for NDIS investments. And I'll be talking to Rabobank economist Michael Levery about the Chinese economy's recovery. In the meantime, you catch me on Facebook, Twitter and LinkedIn. And if you want, leave a comment. Wishing you all a safe and healthy week and looking forward to bringing you talking business next week.